Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's take up the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper. The Supreme Court has finally decided to step in and come to the rescue of migrant workers whose lives have been completely turned upside down as a result of the pandemic induced lockdown. After months of delay, the Supreme Court has finally woken up and it has decided to hold the central government and the state governments accountable for their lapses in ensuring the well-being of the migrant workers. The Supreme Court has ordered the railways and the state governments to not extract money from migrant workers for train tickets and bus tickets which are supposed to take them back home. This ruling has established that the central government and the state governments had earlier misled the court when they had claimed that they were arranging for free transportation for migrant workers. Reports had emerged that in several instances migrant workers were being charged for these tickets and the supreme court has held the center and the states accountable for these lapses the supreme court has also directed the originating state that is the state where the migrant worker is boarding the train or the bus and as well as the destination state that is the state where the migrant worker is headed to to jointly work together and pool their resources in order to fund the travel expenses of the migrant workers The Supreme Court has directed all the states to ensure that migrant workers who are found to be walking on highways should be taken to the nearest camps and it would be the responsibility of these originating states to arrange for adequate shelter and food for these migrant workers. The originating states have been mandated to speed up the registration process and arrange for adequate transportation facilities. That during the journey it would be the responsibility of the railways to arrange for free food and water for the migrant workers the destination states have also been asked to put in place the required health screening facilities to arrange for adequate transport facilities to take the migrant workers to their respective districts and to provide for the required shelter and food facilities as well so through this ruling the supreme court has finally stepped up to the cause of migrant workers who have been going through immense suffering as a result of the lockdown through this ruling The Supreme Court has also held the center and the states accountable for their lapses. See there is no doubt that the migrant crisis that we have seen over the last 2 months has to be one of the biggest incidents of human suffering seen in modern India. In scale it is comparable to the crisis seen during the 1947 partition and to the suffering of Bengali refugees who came in from East Pakistan prior to the 1971 liberation of Bangladesh war. even though the central government and the state governments have put in their best efforts over the last 2 months a number of lapses have been noted which has resulted in immense suffering amongst migrant workers holding the governments accountable for these lapses was the duty of the judiciary but unfortunately the supreme court as well let down the migrant workers by repeatedly postponing the hearings related to these cases human right activists and legal experts had criticized the judiciary for this inordinate delay and it leaves us wondering whether this ruling of the supreme court has come a little too late now let's take up an editorial from page number 6 which evaluates the prospects for indian exports in a post covid 19 world see the official trade data that has been brought out by the government for the month of april paints a very grim picture it shows that india has registered one of the lowest trade flows in the last two decades According to this data merchandise exports out of India has fallen by a massive 60% whereas imports on the other hand have registered only a slight contraction the most worrying fact is that if you look at India's 30 biggest export products only 2 out of them have registered positive growth that is iron ore and pharmaceuticals it is quite clear that this drastic fall in indian exports was a direct result of the lockdowns that were imposed by governments around the world key markets for indian exports such as the united states europe china and southeast asia as they went into a lockdown mode it drastically brought down demand and investment and these lockdowns completely disrupted the global supply chains and global shipping so naturally the impact of these lockdowns were primarily responsible for bringing down indian exports but what should worry the indian government is that Indian exports were declining even before the lockdown. This was because even before the COVID-19 pandemic, the Indian economy had begun to stagnate and this was having a direct impact on Indian exports. So considering the decline in the Indian economy, 
and the impact of the pandemic, what we need is a set of fresh policy ideas that could extend direct support to the export industry in order to revive Indian exports. But unfortunately, the 20 lakh crore economic stimulus package announced by the government of India does not extend any direct support for the export industry. But however, the stimulus package does provide for a number of indirect measures that could support the export industry. For example, the bold policy reforms that have been introduced in few key sectors such as defence, energy, power distribution etc. could help in improving India's ease of doing business index and as well as India's manufacturing capabilities. This in turn could indirectly benefit the Indian export industry. But more importantly, the cheaper and easier loans being provided to the MSME sector under the stimulus package could be of greater help in reviving Indian exports because a number of MSME industries are export-oriented units and the MSME sector accounts for a large share of Indian exports. So these loans that are being extended specifically to the MSME sector along with the focus of the stimulus package to make India self-reliant could promote Indian manufacturing and subsequently Indian exports. Apart from this, the dedicated liquidity facility of 15,000 crore rupees that has been announced by the RBI for the Export Import Bank of India should also help improve Indian exports. But the editorial is of the opinion that these half-hearted measures from the government and the RBI are not sufficient to revive Indian exports. See, reviving exports is very crucial to the economy because export-oriented industries are generally labour-intensive and they have the potential to create massive employment opportunities. So naturally, if exports decline, the unemployment rate could increase and hence, reviving exports is absolutely essential to protect millions of jobs. Then the promotion of exports will also help the government to earn precious foreign exchange and help stabilize India's balance of payments and current account deficit. To further understand how exports and employment are related, especially in a country like India, let us take a look at the performance of India's textile and garment exports over the last few months. See, India happens to be one of the leading exporters of textiles and garments. And if you are aware, you would know that the textile and garment industry is a labour-intensive industry. But in this crucial sector of the Indian economy, exports declined between January and March due to stagnation in the Indian economy. And in the month of April, you can clearly see the impact of the lockdown because textile and garment exports from India declined by a massive 91%. So if the industry is not given direct support from the government and if exports from this industry is not revived immediately, then millions of people would be at the risk of losing their jobs. These grave predictions show that the prospects for Indian exports in the near future does not look very bright. The World Trade Organization has already said that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and lockdowns being imposed around the world, trade flow is going to decline globally by at least around 13-32% to 32 for the rest of the year. Upon this, importing countries will henceforth insist on very high standards of hygiene and sanitary safety and this is going to have a significant impact on the export of medical items, medicines and food products. And for a developing country like India, it would become extremely difficult to maintain these high standards of hygiene and sanitary safety. So if these higher standards are insisted by developed countries as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, then it could become a barrier to trade for Indian exports. See, as of now, the Indian government is hoping to project India as an alternative investment destination to China in order to attract China-based global manufacturers who have been affected by the pandemic. And the government hopes that if manufacturing facilities shift from China to India, then it could revive Indian exports. But this is more of a gamble that the Indian government is taking. And either ways, it would give results only in the long term. So the editorial says that what we need right now is fresh and innovative policy ideas which could extend direct support to the export industry and help revive Indian exports. Because see, in the coming months, there lies a tremendous opportunity for Indian exports. Because governments around the world are giving massive stimulus packages which is expected to increase demand and need for investment. So in the coming months, when global demand for products go up, the Indian export industry should be ready to meet this demand. So if India should not miss out on this rise in global trade that might be witnessed in the coming months, then an urgent intervention is needed from the government.
Now let's take up another editorial from page number six, which deals with the topic of fake news. See, US President Donald Trump is no stranger to fake news and he is no stranger to being politically and diplomatically incorrect. President Trump has constantly alleged that mainstream media outlets such as the New York Times, Washington Post, etc. have always peddled fake news against him and his administration. Critics of Donald Trump have pointed out that the president always peddles fake news and misinformation through his social media accounts. And they even allege that his entire presidential campaign of 2016 was built on fake news, misinformation and propaganda. Recently, an interesting fight took place between President Trump and a popular social media platform, Twitter. A couple of days ago, Twitter had flagged two tweets of President Trump to be factually inaccurate posts. Basically, this was a part of Twitter's initiative to tackle the circulation of fake news on its social media platform. In response to this, the US president threatened to retaliate against Twitter and against all other social media platforms by bringing in a policy to strongly regulate or to close down these social media platforms. President Trump has had a long history of conflict with social media platforms over the topic of fake news, especially with platforms such as Facebook and Twitter. Even though Trump himself has benefited by exploiting the social media platforms to extend his reach and popularity by posting controversial statements on these platforms, he still alleges that these social media platforms are biased against him and against his administration. This ironic incident brings up the topic of fake news, its impact and the need to regulate social media platforms which have emerged as the popular medium to circulate fake news and misinformation. See, when social media platforms emerged more than a decade ago, they were seen as a revolutionary technology because they were decentralized and deregulated. They were not controlled by any single government or by any single entity and hence they were seen to be truly democratic in nature which could provide a voice to the people at the grassroots. This transformative potential of social media platforms has been witnessed on numerous occasions as well. But at the same time, these very social media platforms have been misused by various entities in order to spread fake news, misinformation and propaganda which has managed to have a real world impact. There are numerous instances where social media platforms have indirectly enabled genocides, rigging of elections, overthrowing of democratically elected governments through the spread of fake news on their platforms. Basically, this makes social media platforms a double-edged sword. And the best way to understand this is by looking at the example of Arab Spring, which was a wave of popular uprising against autocratic and dictatorial governments that spread across Africa and Middle East beginning from 2011. See, when the Arab Spring began in Tunisia, it was a genuine organic movement which was initiated by the citizens of Tunisia against an autocratic ruler. The protesters made use of the democratic and decentralized nature of social media platforms to organize themselves and they successfully managed to overthrow the dictator. So this is one instance where social media platforms truly gave a voice to people at the grassroots level. But as the Arab Spring spread like wildfire across Africa and Middle East, the very same social media platforms were misused by various Western interests in order to fulfill their selfish goals. We have seen in Egypt, Libya and Syria as to how global and regional powers and even radical outfits have waged a proxy war by misusing social media platforms in order to achieve their respective geopolitical goals. So considering this potential of social media to be misused, a global campaign has been going on over the years to fight against the menace of fake news. Social media platforms have taken it upon themselves to enforce self-regulation in order to tackle fake news. But the problem with self-regulation is that there would be lack of uniformity and there would be subjectivity in decision making. When a post or a video on a social media platform is factually inaccurate, then through basic fact checking, the social media platform itself can take down the post or flag the post in an objective manner. But when you're dealing with conflicting political views and religious views, there is always an element of subjectivity. Because when you're reviewing such posts, what is right according to me may not be right according to you. This element of subjectivity results in lack of uniformity in decision making 
while enforcing self-regulation by the social media platforms. So this drawback of self-regulation creates a need for regulating content on social media platforms through government regulation. But the problem with government regulation is that governments can misuse these regulations to violate the privacy of individuals and also to curb freedom of expression and dissent. So social media platforms, which are wary of such government overreach, they have always pushed back against government enforced regulation. But social media platforms, especially big tech companies, they need to acknowledge that their platforms and their products have been misused and there are genuine concerns surrounding them, which needs to be tackled through government regulation that strikes a balance between fundamental rights and maintenance of security and law and order. See, the term big tech is collectively used to refer to technology companies that have a global reach. This includes Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, etc. The platforms and products of these companies have raised concerns of privacy, data misuse, political bias, exploitation of monopoly status, tax avoidance, national security, etc. A classic example for this would be the Cambridge Analytica scandal involving Facebook. In that incident, data of Facebook users had been compromised by Cambridge Analytica and it had been misused to shape the political opinion, voting patterns and voting behavior of targeted users. So if these genuine concerns have to be addressed, then there has to be some sort of regulation. But the question is, to what extent should the regulation extend and what should be the checks and balances that should be put in place in order to prevent the misuse of these regulations by the government itself. See, in another article on page number 14, it has been reported that President Trump is likely to sign an executive order which seeks to regulate social media platforms and make them accountable and responsible for the content that is hosted on their platforms. But the problem with such excessive regulation by the government is that the government itself could misuse the regulation to violate the privacy of citizens, to erode freedom of expression, to dilute the freedom of press and stifle dissent and opposition. See, if you look at the ongoing debate in the United States on the need to regulate social media, you will come across multiple opinions within the US. For example, the right-wing Republican Party has always alleged that social media platforms are left-leaning and they do not provide a fair chance for conservative and orthodox views. Democrats, on the other hand, have alleged that social media platforms are being misused by hostile countries to threaten America's national security. This is basically a reference to the alleged Russian interference in the 2016 presidential elections, where reportedly Russian intelligence agencies had misused social media platforms in order to swing the presidential campaign in favor of Donald Trump. Democrats have also alleged that big tech companies have misused their dominant position in the market to resort to unfair trade and labor practices. Then if you look at the global debate as well, you will come across multiple opinions. Civil society activists, human rights activists and a number of concerned citizens, they blame social media platforms for failing to prevent Islamophobia on their platforms. And a number of governments around the world are concerned about Facebook's digital currency, Libra, which could violate their sovereignty over their currency and their monetary policy. So even though there is no clear answer as to what extent social media platforms need to be regulated, a solution has to be found through coordination and cooperation between governments, social media platforms, the big tech companies and the civil society. Now let's take up a column from page number 6, written by former Indian diplomat Rakesh Sood. In this column, the writer evaluates the ongoing border dispute between India and Nepal and he calls for a complete reset of relations between the two countries in order to resolve the dispute. See, the writer first talks about the background to this dispute in complete detail. But we shall not be talking about this because we have covered the background to the border dispute on multiple occasions in the recent days, including on the 10th of May, the 21st of May and the 23rd of May. So kindly go back and watch these videos to understand the historical background to the Indo-Nepal border dispute. So in this discussion, let us just focus on the key argument that is being made by the writer. The writer blames the nationalist politics being followed by Nepal's Prime Minister K.P. Oli to be primarily responsible for the recent flare-up in the border dispute between India and Nepal. The writer acknowledges the complexity of this border dispute 
because the underlying reasons behind this dispute they trace back their origin to the Treaty of Sugoli of 1816. After a series of changes to the boundary between India and Nepal between 1816 and 1947, finally Nepal acknowledged that Kalapani fell under Indian territory, and hence India inherited this boundary in 1947. After India became independent both the countries began a special relationship which was driven by their mutual concern of the Maoist revolution in China in 1949 and the annexation of Tibet by China in 1950 In fact all the Himalayan states including India Nepal and Sikkim which was independent back then they were concerned about China's expansionist tendencies and this pushed small countries such as Nepal to embrace a close defense and strategic relationship with India At the request of Nepal in 1950 the historic treaty of peace and friendship was signed between the two countries which provided for the establishment of a system of open borders and free movement of people This treaty was a recognition of the historical and cultural relationship that both the countries have shared and it was primarily defined by people to people relations Along with this the increasing military threat from China pushed Nepal closer to India and Nepal even allowed India to establish border posts along the Nepal China border so traditionally both the countries have shared a close and cordial relationship even though the border dispute at Kalapani and Susta had reemerged but despite this the border dispute was never allowed to affect the bilateral relationship due to political maturity that was shown by both the sides but over the years india's standing has slowly eroded in nepal and both the countries have to be blamed for this Between 1990 and 2015 India's involvement in Nepal attracted a lot of criticism from Nepal's political parties India's role in Nepal civil war was seen with suspicion then later when Nepal transitioned from a monarchy to a democracy it was seen by the people and political parties of Nepal as being done at the insistence of India later when Nepal was drafting its constitution India tried to protect the rights of Madhesis who inhabit the Terai belt as the madhesis represent a cultural connection between nepal up and bihar so the support extended by india for the cause of madhesis while nepal was drafting its constitution led to the further creation of anti india sentiments amongst the nepali people and as well as amongst its political parties later when nepal's constitution failed to satisfy the demands of the madhesis the madhesis had imposed an economic blockade along the india nepal border and nepal blamed india for this economic blockade due to the support that india had extended for the madhesi cause so over the years due to these developments anti india sentiments have continued to grow in nepal and india has come to be seen as an hegemonic power that displays a big brother attitude towards nepal on one hand india failed to tackle these anti india sentiments and on the other hand nepali politicians who projected themselves as nationalists they exploited these anti india sentiments in order to promote themselves to positions of power it was in the backdrop of these anti india sentiments that kp oli rose to power and became the prime minister in 2017 by projecting himself as a nepali nationalist who had the courage to stand up to a powerful neighbor such as india this is where the china angle comes into question and india has been wary of kp oli's pro china inclination because naturally kp oli would have a desire to cultivate closer relations with china in order to project himself as a powerful leader who can stand up against india but despite this over the last two and a half years relations between the indian government and the kp oli government had been relatively stable but the sudden emergence of the border dispute in 2020 and the strong statements of kp oli against india can be traced to his weakening political position in nepal's domestic politics see if you look at nepal's constitution it provides a secure tenure for the prime minister for a period of 2 years within this period a no confidence motion cannot be moved against the prime minister so basically the prime minister of nepal remains untouched for a period of 2 years and this guaranteed tenure came to an end in february 2020 so this allows opposition parties and those who are opposed to him within his own political party to move a no confidence motion against his prime ministership over the last 2 years KP Oli has been seen as an inefficient leader and there has been growing resentment within his party and as well as amongst the opposition parties so this growing resentment 
and the increasing chances of a no-confidence motion being moved against him might have pushed K.P. Oli to capitalize on the inauguration of the Lipu Lake Road by India. By reigniting a settled dispute, K.P. Oli might be trying to invoke his credentials as a Nepali nationalist in order to strengthen his position and continue to remain in power as Nepal's Prime Minister. The writer also says that the cause for friendly relations between India and Nepal has not been helped by insensitive comments that have come from the Indian side as well. In response to the stand taken by the Nepal government and in response to the controversial statements made by K.P. Oli, the Indian Army chief also issued a set of controversial statements which indicated that Nepal was raising the border dispute at the behest of China. The former diplomat labels this as an insensitive comment which could further complicate the dispute. So that's the reason why the writer says that there has to be a complete reset in the India-Nepal relationship because both the sides have allowed the relationship to decline over the years and what we need currently is political maturity and diplomatic maturity on both the sides which can help in cutting down on rhetoric on territorial nationalism and such a reset in the relationship could help in laying the groundwork for quite diplomatic dialogue between the two countries which can help in resolving the dispute. Now let's take up an article from page number 11. Lawyers from the Haryana High Court have filed a petition at the Supreme Court challenging the constitutional validity of a controversial law that was passed by the Haryana government. Recently, the government of Haryana had passed the Haryana Official Language Amendment Act 2020, which makes Hindi the official language to be used in the High Court of Haryana. The constitutional validity of this law has been challenged by those lawyers who are not comfortable and proficient in using Hindi and they feel that this is an attempt to impose Hindi on non-Hindi speakers. So this brings us to the debate of national language versus official language. See, language is always an emotive issue for people because of its cultural connections. And in a diverse country like India, where hundreds of languages are spoken, designating an official language or a national language can always be highly controversial. See, there is a wrong perception amongst many people that Hindi has been declared as the national language of India. But sorry to say this, the constitution does not give any such recognition and instead it only recognizes the official languages. Under the 8th schedule of the Indian constitution, 22 native languages have been recognized as official languages and under article 343, only Hindi and English have been recognized as the languages to be used for official business. This is because Hindi and English are the only languages which can act as link languages in such a diverse country. So the constitution allows both Hindi and English to be used for official business of the government, the legislature and as well as the judiciary. So this law passed by the Haryana government, which makes only Hindi the official language in the High Court, has been challenged on its constitutional validity. And since the days of the Constituent Assembly, there has been a raging debate to declare Hindi as a national language. But this demand has been opposed by a majority of Indians because even though Hindi is the link language, it is still a minority language. According to the 2011 census, Hindi is the spoken language for less than 44% of India's population. And Hindi happens to be the mother tongue of less than 25% of India's population. Now let's take up an article from page number 16, which can be important for prelims. Researchers and students from the Bodoland University in Assam have developed a fungal powder which is set to boost our immunity during the time of a global pandemic. This fungal powder has been extracted from a parasitic super mushroom known as Cordyceps militaris. It is a very rare and expensive mushroom that is parasitic in nature and it feeds on insects and other types of fungi. This super mushroom is known for its anti-aging, antiviral properties and it is also known to boost our immunity. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. Which of the following places is located the closest to the Zojila Pass? The correct answer is option C, Kargil. This question has been asked because on page number 1, the Hindu carries an image of an army convoy that is moving towards the Zojila Pass in the Dras sector located in Ladakh. Please look at this map. This is where the Zojila Pass is located. It serves as a connection between the Kashmir Valley and Ladakh. Amongst the given options, the closest location to Zojila Pass was Kargil. 
and also remember that the zojila pass is strategically very important to india it is through the zojila pass that national highway number no. 1 passes through which connects srinagar and leh it is along this route that the zojila tunnel is being constructed in order to provide for all weather connectivity and once completed the zojila tunnel would be the longest bidirectional tunnel in asia now let's take up the next practice question in which of the following protected areas can we find the indian rhinoceros is it in the kaziranga national park or the jaldapra national park dudwa national park manas national park or the bandavgad national park the correct answer is option c 1 2 3 and 4 only see the indian rhinoceros also known as the one horned rhinoceros or the great indian rhinoceros has been listed as vulnerable on the iucn red list the historic range of the indian rhinoceros stretched across the indo gangetic plain and the brahmaputra plain historically the one horned rhinoceros could be found in parts of pakistan india nepal bangladesh bhutan and as well as in few parts of myanmar but today the range of the indian rhinoceros is extremely restricted and it can be found only in india and nepal and within india we can find the indian rhinoceros in the protected areas of assam west bengal up and parts of bihar so based on this logic you can eliminate the bandavgad national park which is located in madhya pradesh whereas the kaziranga national park is located in assam and has the highest population of the rhinoceros in the wild then you have the jaldapra national park in west bengal which has the second highest population in india then we have the dudwa national park in up located along the india nepal border and the manas national park again in assam this question has been asked because on page number 1 the hindu carries an image which shows a flooded national park in assam and the rhinoceros which is wading through these floods this also highlights the annual threat faced by the indian rhinoceros whenever the brahmaputra river floods in assam now let's take up the next practice question the ambitious sagar mala project involves which of the following components port modernization and new port development port connectivity enhancement port linked industrialization coastal community development coastal shipping and inland waterways transport all the five are the components of the sagar mala project and hence option d is the right answer see the sagar mala project involves the modernization of existing ports and as well as the creation of new ports it also involves the modernization of connectivity to these ports by improving inland forms of transportation such as inland roadways railways inland waterways etc under this ambitious project port led industrialization has also been planned by establishing special economic zones and industrial zones along the ports it also plans to promote sustainable development amongst the coastal communities and also to modernize coastal shipping and inland waterways transport this question on the status of indian ports has been asked because the 100 years ago article from page number 7 refers to the neglect of indian ports by the british administration now let's take up the next practice question the uighur community frequently seen in news are native to the xinjiang province of china option c is the right answer see the uighur muslims are native to the xinjiang province of china and they are said to be an oppressed minority as a result of facing oppression at the hands of the chinese government uighur muslims have been demanding independence from china and they have even established a terror outfit for this purpose known as the east turkestan islamic movement or etim this terror outfit has established close connections with various terror outfits that are operating in the afghanistan pakistan region and as well as that are operating across central asia so china has always feared increasing radicalism and extremism in the xinjiang province and it has been alleged that china has of late used inhuman and draconian measures to pull the uighurs away from radicalism and extremism by forcefully pushing them into so called reeducation camps on these grounds western countries led by united states have criticized the chinese government for violating the human rights of uighurs so in support of the uighur minorities the us house of representatives have introduced a bill which calls for imposing sanctions against chinese officials who are responsible for violating the human rights of uighur minority now let's take up the next practice question which two countries account for the highest fdi inflow into india amongst the given options the correct answer is singapore and mauritius option b is the right answer this question has been asked because according to this article on page number 
FDI inflow into India has increased by 13% in the 2019-20 financial year and the largest inflow has come from Singapore followed by Mauritius. And also note that this data related to the inflow of FDI is provided by the Department for Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade which is under the Ministry of Commerce and Industry. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2016 prelims paper. With reference to Red Sanders, sometimes seen in the news, consider the following statements. It is a tree species found in a part of South India. It is one of the most important trees in the tropical rainforest areas of South India. Amongst the given statements, the first statement is correct, but the second statement is incorrect. So option A is the right answer. See, Red Sanders are also referred to as Red Sandalwood. This tree is endemic to few specific parts of South India. It is found only in the Eastern Ghats and to be more specific, it is found in the Shesha Chalam Biosphere Reserve and the Venkateshwara National Park that is found in and around Tirupati. This tree is highly valued as a source of timber and for its medical and cosmetic properties. Due to over-exploitation of red sanders, the IUCN had listed it as endangered on the red list, but recently it has elevated its conservation status to near threatened. The second statement is incorrect because the region where the red sanders is found does not have tropical rainforest vegetation. Instead, in the eastern Ghats, we come across tropical dry deciduous forests. So this makes the second statement incorrect and hence option A is the right answer. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, examine the prospects for Indian exports in the backdrop of the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic stimulus being provided by countries around the world. The second statement, rhetoric and territorial nationalism is the root cause of the India-Nepal border dispute. In this context, evaluate how the relationship could be reset. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.